summer for it. I love this weather because it, allow, it allows me to do the things that I'm passionate about. I get to go outside and spend time in my garage working with my cars, something I'm very passionate about. I love being around those type of things and working with my hands and improving something and and doing something and working on uh, whether it's uh, the car in the garage or something else and taking a step back and looking at what had been accomplished. Those things that we're passionate about. All of us are passionate about something. And in those things, you've dedicated your life, much of it, to those things. You see, the things that we're passionate about aren't things that we have to work to accomplish. So I'd like to ask you, what are you passionate about? What are the things in your life that you long to do? And maybe it's traveling or maybe it's uh, some kind of art or uh, thing that you do in your home or maybe it's uh, a hobby that you have. What are you passionate about? As much as I am passionate about cars, there still is one more thing that I'm more passionate about and that's saving souls. Man, there is nothing greater in my mind than sitting across a desk from somebody studying the Bible and watching that light bulb come on when they get it. When they see a solution to the problem of their sin in their life, realizing that Christ came, died on the cross, was buried, and on the third day rose again to save them from their sin. And that light bulb comes on and that smile comes across their face because they realize at that point in time, They're no longer doomed. What are you passionate about? I'm going to speak to you this morning about something that means a whole lot to me. And I don't know how uh, to really convey this except to the point of what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at Paul's passion. In the scripture that was read, we see this concept developed in this idea that Paul's passion was saving souls. And Paul was willing to do whatever it took to save souls. That may mean he had to change who he was in that moment to save souls. But I want to put this within the context of 1 Corinthians So I believe it's really important for us to understand as we look at this as a bigger picture, this is not a conversation that really needs to be taken out of context of 1 Corinthians, but really brought in the context of what was happening starting in chapter 8. In chapter 8, there is this division, these, these disputes about whether it was okay to eat food offered to idols. And in this situation, there were those who believed it was okay. Because they believe what Paul said and the idea of not that there is any other God. So if it's not against your conscience, it's okay. But in Paul's teaching through this Christianity, through this idea of Paul becoming all things to all men, Paul says, but if it's going to ruin your opportunity to save souls, don't eat it. And as we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and continuing on into chapter 10, into even chapter 11 is this idea that we have to really be careful about who we are because we have the goal to save souls. That's Paul's passion. And there was divisions happening within the church in Corinth that was not allowing them to be successful at saving souls. It it was not allowing them to be successful at being the body of Christ. And they were divided over everything, whether it was uh, who they were to follow in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, whether it was what they should do or what they shouldn't do. In chapter 11, we see the idea that they were divided over even to the point of taking the Lord's Supper. And they had factions of people here taking the Lord's Supper and and factions there taking the Lord's Supper. And they were divided over everything. And Paul takes a step back and says, listen, how are we going to be successful at saving souls with all of these divisions, with all these ideas, with all of these opinions? So Paul, in his passion, 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 tells us, in order to save souls, I became all thing to all men. Look at what he says in verse 19, that I might win more of them. He says that I became a servant to all, that I might win more of them. And then he goes down and says to the Jew, I became a Jew. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. To those outside of the law, I became as one outside of the law. And to the weak, I became as the weak. Why? If you follow it up, look at what the book in Mark say in chapter 9 and verse 19 and chapter 9 and verse 22, that I might save some. Are we passionate about saving souls? Enough to change things. Enough to act differently. So over the course of this lesson, I'd like to challenge us to really evaluate, are we serious about saving souls? I want to ask you that question right now. Are you serious about saving souls? Or right now, do you have the idea that it's only the minister's job to save souls? Well, Dustin's the evangelist. Dan is an evangelist. So it's their job to save souls. It's our job to save souls. And when we become passionate about saving souls, we can realize that we have this idea, this opportunity to go into the world and save souls. But I think we cannot be passionate about this idea of saving souls unless we truly realize that souls need to be saved. Do we realize in this world there is a problem of sin? Do you realize, honestly realize right now that there are people in this world lost? There may be people in this room this morning lost. Once we realize that there are people lost, that there is truly a problem, then we can open our eyes and see there truly are souls that need to be saved. You see, look at Paul's perspective in his time going through who he was. Remember in Acts chapter 9 on that road to Damascus? Paul was in that position before that road that he was lost. Yeah, he believed in God, but what? He was still lost. He wasn't who he should be. And there are a lot of good people who believe in God that don't have the whole story. And we have to have that passion, that enthusiasm. You see, a lot of people will say, well, there's a different. You can be passionate and not be enthusiastic. I disagree. I disagree. I believe that if you're passionate about something, you will be enthusiastic about it. Because it should overflow out of us. It should be something that we cannot contain within us if we're passionate about it. And we see that with Paul. He was so passionate about who he was that, first of all, we see him subjecting himself to God's agenda. Not man's agenda. It wasn't what Paul wanted to be accomplished. We see that. Remember, the apostles struggled with man's agenda. Remember, they asked Christ, can I sit on your right and your left hand? That's man's agenda. Well, how are you going to die? Peter had this problem with Christ saying he was going to die. How are you going to die? How are we going to overthrow the Roman Empire? That's man's agenda. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we see Paul subjecting himself to God's agenda. God's agenda of saving souls. God's agenda that said, I'm going to set up my church. I'm going to send my son. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what he believed to be of first importance. What? That Christ died, was buried on the third day, according to the scriptures, rose from the grave. That's God's agenda. So Paul dedicated himself to subjecting himself to God's agenda. So how do we do that? Let's work through the text. One who subjects himself to God's agenda becomes a servant of all. 
One who subjects himself to God's agenda becomes a servant of all. Meaning it's never about Paul anymore. It's never about what Paul wanted anymore. He gave that life up. That was, the, that was Saul. That was the old man. The persecutor of persecutors. Hebrew of Hebrews. But Paul now has become a servant of all. Because Paul realized in order for me to be effective at saving souls, in order for me to be in subjection to God's agenda, I have to be a servant of all. I have to serve people. I have to be where people are. So how does he do that? Well, look at what the text says. Verse 20. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win the Jews. Notice the pattern that's developed in this text. Notice the phrases like, in order to win, okay? In order order to win the Jews, he says, I became as a Jew. To those under the law, I became as one under the law. Look at, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. Look, here it is again. That I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak. That I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people. That by all means, I might save some. Let me ask you a challenging question. Are you willing... To give something up, save souls. Are you willing to maybe not post something on Facebook to win souls? I don't care. You may be a staunch Biden supporter or a staunch Trump supporter. But I'm going to tell you what. That right now in our country is a level of divisiveness. So maybe... If my passion is to save souls, maybe I should watch the t-shirt I wear without his face on it. Or without the other guy's face on it. And maybe the post I post on Facebook maybe shouldn't be a political rant. Because I'm going to guarantee you one thing. As much of people that you may gain, you're going to lose the same amount of people because of what you post. Is that going to help us save souls, church? We have to realize that what we're doing is either going to help us save souls or not. And if it's not helping us save souls in order that we might win some, we have to stop. We have to stop doing that. So he says in this idea, I became a servant of all. Second, number two, he says, I in order or the one who subjects himself to God's agenda will meet people where they are. To a Jew, I became a Jew. In Acts chapter 9, I think about after Paul was converted. After the text says he ate and regained his health, where did he go? He went to the synagogue. Now, did Paul believe that's the only place that you could properly preach the gospel? Absolutely not. But why? He went where the people were. He met the Jews on the Jews' terms. And I guarantee you one thing. If he would have been staying with a Jewish family that kept the Sabbath holy and didn't work, guess what Paul wouldn't have done on that day? Worked. But you see, Paul realized, I got to meet people where people are. He says, not only to the Jews did I become a Jew, but he says, to those under the law, I became as one under the law. Now, that's both Jewish people. One is a Jewish by nationality. I'm a Jew. The other idea of those under the law were those who religiously were under Jewish law. Now, when Paul wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 9, were they under the old law or the new law? The new law. So what law was Paul under? The new law. Christ's law. He wasn't under the old law anymore. But when we reference this with the idea of what he's going to say later about to the weak, I became to the weak. Let's go back to the context and say, what did Paul not do? He might not have eaten food offered to idols. He might not have done this in this home. 
the church has been divided lately. I'm going to tell you one thing. I know a lot of you don't like the vaccine. I know a lot of you do. Maybe we should not post our opinions on Facebook about the vaccine. Maybe if you're going to go visit somebody that you know wants to wear a mask, maybe put the mask on. Become all things to all men. In order to what? Win some. Because listen, whether it's a vaccine, whether it's a mask, it's always going to be something. And as I look at the, the food offered to idols, the parallel with food offered to idols and our mask debate is almost the same. People can't get out of our own way. We're so stubborn that we have to be right. And somebody has to be wrong. Can we both be right? Is there ways to watch how we speak to one another in order to save souls? Is there ways that we can act towards one another in order to save souls? Maybe we need to table some of those hot topics and be careful how we speak to one another regarding those things. I was listening to a man on the phone at the grocery store. After listening to his conversation and his opinions about something, I realized very quickly that wouldn't be somebody that I would want to go talk to if I was seeking out the gospel. Have you had those conversations in public? Maybe on social media? That is pushing people away? What about going up to somebody? Maybe one of our young men, after they get up here and they stumble through scripture. It's the first time they've been on stage. It's nerve-wracking. What's going to be effective in growing a relationship with them? Let me give you two scenarios. The first scenario is walking up to the young man, putting your arm around him and encouraging him, telling him how great it was to have him up front and how great it was to hear him read the scripture. But here's a second scenario walking up to the young man, pointing your finger at him and saying, next time, maybe you should rehearse it a little more. Who are you? One of them will have a great opportunity for growth. The other one will push the young man away. See, sometimes we only think about this idea of outside of the church. To the Jew, we became as a Jew. To a Greek, we became as a Greek. To those we came as those, and to those we came as those. I'm going to give you an example. I grew up in Southern California. I've lived in Denver, Wyoming, and now Kentucky. You want to tell me I haven't had to change the things I like and what I don't like to fit in with the congregation that I'm ministering to? I remember, and you guys will all laugh about this. Remember one of the first lessons I gave? I had three balls up here. See, I had poor audience analysis that day. You are, some of you are laughing because you know what I'm talking about. I had three balls. Remember I talked about a baseball in the hand of a pitcher is a lot different than in a hand. And then I had a basketball and I really kind of disrespected your ball. And, and I know it probably took weeks. Maybe some of you still don't like me. Because I threw the ball off the stage. And then I picked up the holy grail of balls. As silly as that may sound, that acts as a simple illustration for us in our lives. Now, is it wrong for me to not like basketball? No. It's not. I have that freedom. Is it wrong for me to like football more? No, it's not. But I'm going to tell you what, if it makes me more effective as a gospel preacher, if it makes me more effective in this community to like basketball more than football, I like basketball more. Becoming all things to all men. 
when I talk to people back in California, I ask how USC's doing. When I talk to people in Wyoming, I ask how those Wyoming cowboys are doing. And uh, when I talk to you, I want to talk about UK. Or some of you I know, I got to talk about Louisville. And if I talk to Stan, I got to talk about how Mississippi State's doing. You know what that looks like and the kind of relationships we build when we're willing to do that? When we're willing to meet people where they are? Are we willing to do that in order to save souls? Number three, one who subjects himself to God's agenda maintains a proper balance. Understand what the text says. I'm not up here telling you to become all things to all men, even if it's against God's word. Paul makes that very clear. He says to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not outside the law of God, though, but but being under the law of Christ. Paul never gave up his submission to God to become as one outside the law. We have to maintain proper balance. So there's basically two areas that I want to hit on real quick. This idea of proper balance, first of all, we're either going to become full inclusion or full exclusion. Now, what do I mean by that? The idea is this. Well, uh, maybe some people hold the idea of becoming all things to all men means including everything. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying within your right, within the law of Christ, become all things to all men. That doesn't mean if you're studying with an alcoholic to go get drunk with the alcoholic. That doesn't mean that. But it also means that when you go and speak to the alcoholic, you love him as a soul. And maybe it's not going to be a good conversation starter to walk up to the alcoholic and say, you know you're going to hell if you don't give that up. Becoming all things to all men is being able to sit with the woman at the well. Christ ate with sinners and tax collectors. Did that mean he became a sinner himself? No, it's not a full inclusion, but it's also not a full exclusion. A full exclusion taking about certain groups that have secluded themselves out of the world. Think about monks that go and seclude themselves. Think about people who have come up with communities. And they only associate with themselves. Let me ask you a question. If we seclude ourselves from the world, how are we going to bring the world the gospel? If I were to seclude myself from the world, why would I need the whole armor of God that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6? I'm supposed to put those things on so I can be part of the world. But that doesn't mean going too far and becoming an alcoholic to save the alcoholic. Well, I took up using drugs because I wanted to reach the meth addicts. That means I go hang out at the strip club so I can be... That's not what Paul's saying. That means that I'm going to hang out with this group. But it also doesn't mean if we maintain proper balance that we're not, listen to me, speaking out of both sides of our mouth. To this group, I talk about these things. And I slander that group. And to that group, I talk about these things and slander that group. That's not what Paul's talking about. Becoming all things to all men is becoming a servant of all. Becoming all things to all men is meeting people where they are. And becoming all things to all men is maintaining a proper balance. And finally... Becoming all things to all men or keeping oneself in subjection to God is the idea that we must absolutely have to keep ourselves under control. If you turn over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the very last section of chapter 9, he says this. Verse 25, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body. Look at 
and keep it under control. That literally means to be put in subjection under. I keep it under my uh, under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Church, do we realize people are lost? You may know somebody right now who's lost, and they need you. They need you to meet them where they are. They need you in their lives to bring them, wherever they're from, to Christ. Is what we're saying, is what we're posting, is how we're acting, bringing them and bringing us an opportunity to save their soul, to bring them the gospel, or is it turning them away? I had to get off Facebook. Because it was developing a hate in my heart. It was developing somebody that I didn't want to be. Because I could see brothers spewing hate at each other on Facebook. I know I'm drilling that point hard because I think we really struggle with it. But I want to leave you with this analogy. You just moved to Paducah. And you have several friends that are already here and you look at your Facebook and you're reading down and you see this person post something on it and you say, man, I just don't agree with that. And then you see this person over here uh, re- uh, rebuttal to that and, and now you see this feud on Facebook and then the very next Sunday you show up at church and somebody comes up and introduces yourself as one of those people. How are you going to feel in that situation? is what we're doing, how we're acting, what we're posting, allowing us to save souls. Do we have the same passion Paul had when he says that I might save some? That's our main objective, church. That's who we are. Therefore, we must Subject ourselves to God's agenda and become a servant of all. We must subject ourselves to God's agenda and meet people where they are. We must subject ourselves to God's agenda and maintain a proper balance. And we must subject ourselves to God's agenda and keep ourselves under control. There's a world of lost people out here that needs this body. They need you. What are we willing to change in our lives that we might win some? Let's pray. Father, please humble ourselves. Father, please allow us to maintain this idea that there are those that are lost, that sin is real. Father, help us to do things to make us most effective in this world. Father, help us to throw our pride out the door, our own opinions, our own ideas. Father, help us to be in control of the things we post and the things we type and the things we say and the things we do. Father, help us to have the same attitude where Paul had in this idea of saving souls. Father, help us to truly be a tool in your kingdom. Help us to truly have a passion and enthusiasm to save souls. Father, we're so thankful that you put us in this world that we could be effective tools for you. Father, help us to get out of our own way. Help us to show people you through our lives. Help us save souls. Father, please put seekers in our paths. So when they're in front of us, we can be effective for you. Father, help us to be in subjection to your agenda and not our own. We pray all these things through your son. Amen. I hope this morning, as you hear these words from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 
that we can really truly evaluate our lives and see where we can improve. See where we could change so more souls can be saved through our lives and through our actions. If you have a need this morning, maybe there's something you need to repent of. Maybe it's a brother or a sister in this room that you need to go find as soon as that closing prayer is said and ask for forgiveness. Maybe it's a post you need to go back on and delete on Facebook. Or maybe it's simply asking for forgiveness from somebody. Whatever your need may be this morning, now is the time to change it. While together we stand and while we sing the song that's been selected. We have heard.